Ace White says, uh, what was the first job that really solidified your interest in the field? And was there ever a magic moment where you realized that you'd found your thing? I love a question that is hoping for a specific narrative when it turns out I have that narrative to give. This is great, Ace. Um, so as I've been describing, I worked in New York in special effects for a few different places. In 1990, uh, my a good friend of mine at the time called me and asked me to come be his roommate here in San Francisco. I came out to San Francisco and found an unbelievable city where I could kind of try everything that I wanted. Uh, in New York, if you wanted to get your sculpture or art shown in the gallery, there were like waiting lists for even the tiniest gallery in the most far torn corner of the five boroughs. It still took two years to get someone to look at your sides. In San Francisco, man, you could glue a couple things together and have them in a gallery by the end of the month. It it is one of the reasons that San Francisco embraced me and I embraced San Francisco. And just to give a little side note here. One of the key reasons I left New York is because I didn't have any idea really what I wanted to do. I didn't have ambition. And New York is a terrible city if you don't know what your ambition is. It is unforgiving. If you know what your ambition is, New York is ready to run you through the paces. San Francisco is a great place to be and not know your ambition. Um, it means that the sort of base level of art in New York is, a, a, of in general, a much higher quality than in San Francisco. I'll admit that. And I think the same about Los Angeles. Um, at the same time, San Francisco provided and provide, provided me, and I think still provides, people a place to really let their freak flag fly without without too many expectations. And that was a perfect, a perfect environment, a perfect hot box for me to figure out what my ambition was. So I spent a few years in theater, working for George Coates Performance Works, the Eureka Theater, Project Arto, doing a bunch of black box. This was an amazing theater town back in the early 90s. Then I started getting the attention of the film industry and Jamie called me up, uh, said, uh, I'm working on a Nike commercial. I've heard a lot about you. Come in and show me some stuff. I showed him some stuff and I started working on the Nike commercial. And very quickly, Jamie saw uh, this guy has a whole bunch of different weird skills and he's very uh, applicable towards many different jobs. And Jamie started giving me a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, commercial work is long days when you're on set and you just got to be ready. And like I said, I had just about at that time in my life learned how to work hard to really apply myself. So, oh, also the other thing that was happening commensurate with all this, I worked for Beach Blanket Babylon as a backstage tech. Uh, I worked for Berkeley Repertory Theater and I was making sculpture all the time. I was, I was a sculptor and I had shows at Art Attack Gallery and the Nelson Morales Gallery and Katie Clark's Gallery. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I showed all of, I probably 30 different group shows in San Francisco in the first three or four years I was in, I was here. Um, so all of these things happen. I start working for Jamie on the regular and now I'm, I'm really, now I'm working in the commercial special effects industry and it's taking a lot of my time and energy. Not that that's a bad thing, but what I notice after about six months or eight months is I'm not making sculpture at home. The whole time I was working in theater, I would be working full days and then come back to my loft and work all night. I, the, the eternal energy of youth. Um, but here I was working just as hard or harder in the special effects industry. And now I was going home and not doing anything. And I started to examine that in myself. And I thought, you know, part of the reason I'm not working on the sculpture is because all of the aesthetic and mechanical problem solving that I make sculpture in order to enjoy is being fed by this industry, by special effects. And sure, I'm selling products for the man, but on the granular level, at the workbench level, the work is just, it's just as satisfying to my brains and my hands. Now, if you spend any time on a film set, you're going to meet a lot of people who will say things like, I used to be an artist, I used to be a painter. And having grown up with a painter and having called myself an artist, I thought specifically at that moment when I realized 
that less of my mental energy was going into the sculpture because it, the, the, the employment was feeding that part of my brain, I made a conscious decision not to say I used to be. Because I don't think that stuff leaves you. I think when you, when you allow yourself to go on aesthetic explorations that are purely for personal exploration, which is one of the ways I define art, um, that, that exploration informs everything else that you do in the best possible way. So I didn't lament that I was no longer making sculptures. I, I stopped trying to show my work or get in group shows because I started putting all of my energy into, into this field. Um, and the idea was, okay, this is what a career probably feels like. Here are all of my disparate skills and they're all necessary for this thing that I'm doing for a living. That's, that felt like an amazing thing to realize. Like, oh, this is what people mean by a career. Okay, I'll give in for a while. Let's see how much this feeds me. And yeah, it fed me, man. I mean, not, and not just, not just the literal feeding, but it fed my creative brain and it fed my artistic brain. And it, it, it fed that kind of problem solving that I, that I revere, that I seek from the workbench. Um, that was the magic moment. I mean, you know, I would have several more tiers of understanding as I went through the special effects industry. That was actually just one of the key ones to realize like, well, okay, it's important to say why I, how I realized the split was happening because it had already happened to me once before. And this is just another little side story. So it's the late 80s and I'm living in New York. And again, I'm living in my parents' house and, and I'm making sculpture in the basement. This is again, part of me, Adam the sculptor. And I'm making sculpture all the time. And then I got obsessed with pool and I started playing pool and billiards. And in the late 90s, there was a huge, in the late 80s, excuse me, there was a huge boom in pool and billiards in New York and there were pool halls everywhere. And I was visiting many of them on a daily basis. I was literally playing at like two different pool halls every day for the record society billiards and chelsea billiards um julian's was where the hardcore betting was happening and i didn't want part of that scene at any rate i noticed that the more i spent on learning and investigating and dive, diving into billiards and pool the less sculpture i made so i i had already learned by the age of like 21 22 that when you're feeding one part of your brain it sometimes needs to do the other thing it used to do to do that feeding less. And I'd seen this kind of these shifts of these interest fields. So I was attuned to that when it showed up again, uh, working for Jamie. Thank you, Ace. That is like, it's a great question. C2 Lawson, did freelance work play a big part in your past experience? And can you offer any advice on setting prices? Oh, this is such a good question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, first of all, freelance is kind of the only way I have worked for decades. Um, yeah, uh, film work is freelance work. There are permanent jobs, permanent, uh, in film, but they are few and far between films are the best way to think of a film from a business standpoint is uh, a film is a company that is started to make a thing called that film that it's been built to make. And then when that film is done, that company like goes away. Like it is, it is a serial operation of capitalism. So there's very little throughput from film to film, especially in special effects. So you are always freelance. Even at ILM, when I like, even when I had their reputation and the chops and enough experience to be regularly hired at ILM, I was still only working like 60, 65% of the time there. The rest of the time I had to augment with other jobs. So freelancing is hard. Uh, it takes a certain mindset and that mindset is what's next? What's next? You're never in freelancing. You might get a job and get paid 10,000 bucks for that job this for three weeks of work. And you're like, yeah, man, I just made some dough. That'll pay my rent for five months. The question you should be asking is what do I do after that? Like the freelancer's brain is never not going. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And it's a, it's a great frame to hold in your head as a freelancer. And it is really, really important. I mean, even in television production, I'm freelance, right? I do a show and if it gets picked up, I do more episodes of that, but when it's done, I'm done. It's not this, yeah. I mean, at higher work, it's kind of made us all freelancers, right? Which is a problem, but that's a whole nother issue. 
Um, you want advice on setting prices. Okay. The only way you can learn how to set prices is to set them right and set them wrong and learn the difference between the two and ask for advice from people in your industry and keep asking for advice and keep asking for advice. I will tell you, though, that one of the things I have learned is your goal, your goal, my goal as a freelancer was always to set the price. If you came to me as a client and said, could you build this for me? My goal is to that the first number I tell you is 10% more than you were hoping to spend. That's the inside baseball and freelance price setting. I want to go, I want to, if you think, oh, I'd love to get this table built, but I can only afford 500 bucks. My goal would be to give you a bid of 550 bucks. Because whatever we think we want to spend, we know we can spend a little bit more. That's one thing. Secondly, as a freelancer, I want to I want what the market will bear. I want I want to be able to extract from you what you're willing to pay in terms of my in terms of my time and energy, but also I don't want to charge you so much you're really unhappy. I don't want to charge twice what you're going to what you're going to pay. But at 10% more, you could even go 550 is a little much for me. Can you lower that? The almost the very first thing I'd be willing to do, chop 10% right off the price I've just quoted. And now that was like, it's funny. So at one point, um, when was this? In the mid nineties, the San Francisco Maritime Museum uh, asked me to bid on making a replica of a piece from their collection. And they sent me some drawings and some pictures and I bid it at a thousand, I bid it at $950. Yeah, I bid it at $950 to build this piece. And they were like, ah, it's too expensive. And then my friend who had gotten me the chance to make the bid told me that they ended up spending 860 bucks on making this thing. And that, that was a, an appreciable difference to them, right? That between my 950 and the 860, they spent to do it internally. And I was like, holy hell, I bid precisely to the dollar 10% more than they were hoping to spend. And then I told my friend, I was like, you know, they should have just asked me. I would have literally chopped off that back, back end. Now that was, so how do you charge 10% more than they're hoping to ask? That is one of those, you, you learn about the client. Like if it's pharma, they can totally afford it. <laughs> uh, you learn about, you know, maybe it's a client you've worked before, before that's, that's one of the best ways you'll have knowledge about what they're willing to spend. Um, sometimes you have back channels. Sometimes you have someone who brought you the job who can help you learn what they were hoping to spend. That is great intel to get and really, really important. I heard once about a supervisor who used to bid like this. He would go, all right, this is, we've looked at all your figures and it's a $20,000 job. And then he'd look at your face. And if you went, he'd be like, now that doesn't include <laughs> delivery and taxes and sundries and contingencies. And he would just keep on tacking stuff until your face fell. And then he'd like stop there because he knew he had kind of extracted the most amount from the equation. And I don't mean to give the impression that the goal here is to extract the maximum amount of money, even though it sort of is. There's also an expectation of what the market will bear. If you're a company hiring a special effects company, presumably you've hired other special effects companies, so you have some idea of what the market will bear. And how to learn, I know I'm bouncing all over the place. I'm sorry. There's a lot to get through here, and I'm, I'm excited about it. What the market will bear is a moving target, and it's one that you learn, and it's part of the institutional knowledge of what you'll learn in any industry that you're working in. Um, the most granular way I have learned to set prices, and I still do it this way, is to, like, the first pass with any bid is how many person days will this project take? Well, one person will sell this. That'll take them four days. This person will cast these pieces. I'll need them for two days. Uh, I'll need to do five days worth of problem solving for this. So it's a total of nine or 10 days or whatever. My Once I've figured out the actual hours of labor it'll likely take, I then bid it at 500 bucks per person day. And that sounds like a lot, um, but that number has worked for me for uh, 20 years or more in, in setting prices. Now, part of that is a wage stagnation, I would guess. But at the same time, 500 bucks a day is a great place to start for a home shop because you might not think that you're worth that, but making a shop work 
That, that is a reasonable price. That is a reasonable place. That's a reasonable price to use to get yourself into the ballpark of what the thing costs. In the early part of your career, I am almost guaranteeing you that someone will come to you and offer you what sounds like a lot of money for something. And it's actually painfully low. I remember someone coming to me and asking me to build 10 four by eight flats for them. And they wanted to pay me $5,000 for this. And I thought, 10 flats for 5,000 bucks. I could do those all in like two days. That seems crazy. And then I talked to my friend Todd, who's a scenic artist. And he's like, dude, he's trying to get you to build a whole set. That's like a seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 job to build the set he wants you to build. He's broken it down into flats, but each flat has to be finished differently. And each of them has to join together and it's going to be a whole set. He can't have that that cheap. He's trying to screw you. Todd, I'm still grateful to you for that bit of knowledge and insight. If you're a professional, make yourself available to a young upstart to give them advice like that. I certainly do. And I love it when friends call me up and ask me uh, for advice about a specific job or a specific thing. It, it's like pay it forward, man. Uh, because those people that gave me that advice in the early parts of my career were super, super critical. Oh, we're doing great here. Thank you guys so much for watching that video. If you'd like to further support us here at Tested, one of the best ways you can do it is through a Tested membership. And there's a link below as to the various levels of Tested membership, but it's so much more than just exclusive videos. There are exclusive videos, but there are also live stream Q and A's. And the thing that I love most about the Tested members is the interactivity, uh, the wonderful communication between not just me and Tested members, but our whole Tested team. Every single day, it feels more and more like a community just devoted to the joys of making things. So join yourself up and become one of us.